a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You will hear a woman calling an accommodation agency about properties to rent. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions one to four. Easy let. Good morning. How can I help you? Hello. I saw your advertisement in the paper, and I'm calling to ask about renting a flat. Certainly. What kind of flat had you in mind? Well, um... I don't know exactly. I mean, it depends on price to some extent. OK. Now, we have properties across the whole range. The average is probably £120 a week. Oh, I was hoping for something a little cheaper. They start at £90, that's the lowest we have usually, and they go up to £200. I could manage the lowest figure. An important question is how long you're thinking of staying in the property. We don't do short lets. I'd want a flat for nine months, perhaps longer. That would be fine. Our contracts are for a standard six months, and that can be extended. Fine. I'd need to come in and see you? Yes. Our office is open from 9am to 5pm. I'd need to come in on Saturday. OK, then we're here between 10am and 4pm. We also open on Sunday mornings until 1pm. Saturday is fine. If possible, I'd like to see details of some properties first. We can post you a list, or you may find it easier to look on the internet. Oh yes, I have the address here. Thank you. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 7. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 7. What else would you like to know? I wonder what I might need to buy for a flat. What's included in the rent? That depends on the flat to a certain extent, although some things are standard in all flats. For example, every flat has kitchen equipment provided for your use. Good. Does that also mean tableware, cups, glasses, plates? In some flats, but not all. OK. And bathroom towels, sheets and so on? I don't think any flats have those included. I can easily buy some. I don't suppose flats come with a TV? In fact, they all do, although they may not be the most modern models. Oh, that's fine. But it's different with the telephone. That's up to you to organise. These days, most people seem just to use their mobile phone. I can imagine. What extra charges would I get? Is heating extra? Yes, it is. But the water bill is part of the rent, so you don't have to pay for that. Right. I've noted all that. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Are you looking to move into a flat soon? I hope so, yes. The thing is, we have a few flats at the moment that we'd like to get rented out by the end of the month. I see. They're all good flats and at the price you want. There's one in Eastern Towers, 
one in Granby Mansions and another in Busby Garden. All three are nice blocks of flats. Could you tell me where they are? I'm at the train station at the moment. Eastern Towers, if you're coming from the station, isn't very far. Cross over City Bridge, then go left, and where the road divides, you want the right hand fork. You'll see Eastern Towers on the left side of the road. It's a lovely building with trees around it. That sounds nice. What about Granby Mansions? The best way to get there from the station is probably to go down River Road and then cross over Old Bridge. The road bends to the right round the park, and if you follow along, you'll find it there on the left side. That's a great location with lovely views of the park. Very nice. And you said there was one more? Busby Garden, yes. Okay, from the station, cross over City Bridge, keep going through the first crossroads until you come to the second crossroads. Busby Garden will be facing you over to the right side. It's very convenient for the shops. Fine, thank you. Well, I'll see you on Saturday. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2. You will hear a talk for teachers about the Holy Lands Museum and Education Centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 and 12. Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 and 12. It's nice to see so many of you here. I'm going to tell you something about Holy Lands, our facilities and activities and the exhibitions we have coming up. I hope you'll find it interesting and bring your pupils along. <laughs> For most of what we have to offer here, you can just turn up with your party. I'm pleased to say that recent work has meant that the whole centre is prepared for blind visitors. There are a couple of activities where we ask you to book a week in advance. We only have artists that you can watch painting at certain times, so we need notice of your coming for that. The other activity requiring at least seven days' notice is the drama workshop. Again, it's a question of organising the staff at this end. But the video you work yourself, and so that's available any time. Another activity where you need to think ahead is the garden sculpture experience, but that's a question of the weather, which of course we can't control. <laughs> Speaking of weather, we run a reduced range of facilities in the winter months. While the cafe and the shop provide welcome shelter from the cold and rain, I'm afraid our artist in residence scheme isn't run in the winter, so the studio is closed then. And the animals in the mini zoo are kept indoors for warmth during the cold months, so that doesn't operate either. The adventure playground does, though <laughs> make sure the children are wrapped up well. Now you have some time to look at questions 13 to 17. Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions 13 to 17. OK. Now, we run a programme of exhibitions through the year, so I'll tell you about the next few. Our current exhibition, Local Lives, ends on the 26th of August, and then one called History in Pictures starts on the 28th of August. This includes all sorts of objects and experiences from the past, such as farm machinery and some cars. We're sure children will love the chance to have a ride on an old bus. <laughs> Next, we're running a show called People at Work, and this will open on the 19th of September. There will be pictures and videos depicting all sorts of jobs, from coal mining to flying planes. 
and there's a careers advice service available for everyone to consult. Following on from that show, we're putting on an exhibition called Land from Air. This starts on the 11th of November and includes hundreds of aerial photographs. A competition accompanies the show with the exciting prize of a balloon trip for two. So we hope to see you at at least one of the exhibitions. Now you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 18 to 20. Now, the area occupied by Hollylands is rather large and we don't want people to get lost. So I'll just give you a few pointers to help you orientate yourselves. So, uh, whether you come by car or bicycle, you'll come in from the road. Cars then park to the left through the gates into the car park and bikes to the right through the gates opposite. Cyclists in particular might be feeling thirsty at this point and you can get a drink from the machine at the end of the bike park halfway to the museum entrance. You can enjoy your drink in the picnic area which is opposite the car park. For anyone who doesn't have a mobile phone, there are payphones at the far end of the picnic area. Over at the opposite end of the picnic area, across the path, are the toilets. Next to them, and just to the right of the entrance to the main museum, is the first aid room, which we hope you won't need, but it's there in case you do. If you have any queries, please go to the manager's office, which is behind the picnic area. And last but not least, You'll need to buy your tickets or show your group pass to the ticket office on the left of the museum entrance. OK, <laughs> I'll pause there. Um, are there any questions at this point? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part two. Part 3. You will hear two university students discussing their course and a project they are doing together. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Martin. Hi, Kate. How are you? Fine. I'm relieved to have done my presentation. I'm sure. How did it go? Oh, OK in the end, but I was ever so nervous beforehand. It's silly because I do know my stuff quite well. I must know those statistics inside out. But when you have to get each table of results to come up in the right order, it can make you nervous. Mm. It was my first time using the computerised projector, and I was sure I was going to get the controls wrong or something. And, of course, that's not a good situation if you know you've got to listen to questions carefully and be ready to answer quickly. But it was fine once you got going? Yes. I do feel that the standard of presentations could be improved in general. I think a lot of the lecturers agree with me, although I don't honestly know what they can be expected to do about it. Students need to appreciate the difference between style and content. Too many presentations are just a mass of detailed content, all very worthy, without any attempt to engage people's interest. Basic things like looking at your audience's faces seem to get forgotten, 
and that makes it harder to concentrate on the points made about the research itself. Yes, there are quite a few improvements I'd like to see. Take tutorials, for example. I feel they're often a missed opportunity. I come out not feeling sure about what I've learnt. Week in, week out, I faithfully plough through the reading list, which is fair enough. But then the discussion doesn't seem to extract the main issues. It's frustrating.、Mm, I know what you mean. Mind you, we have to take some responsibility ourselves. I actually got quite a lot from that skills workshop I went to on taking notes, and I'd like to make similar improvements in the next semester.、Hmm. The reading list we get has several websites each time, and I want to learn to navigate my way round them more effectively.、Now、that sounds a good idea. Mind you, it means spending more time in the library. If you can get in. You mean because it's too crowded? It isn't big enough, is it? Well, I don't know. I mean, I like to work late in the evening, and it shuts before I want to finish. But I know you can access the catalogue from a laptop. Which personally, I haven't got. Actually, the problem for me is that I like to get up early and start work straight away, and they don't start until nine. I wish they'd change that. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Look, we ought to start working out what to do next for our project. <laughs> yes, enough moaning. <laughs> okay, the main thing is to allocate the various tasks between us, isn't it? Yes. Well, we're going to need the questionnaire before we can do much else, aren't we? Do you want to handle that? I'd assumed we'd do it together. Well, you have more experience than me. Maybe you could think up the main questions. You know, a first version of the whole thing, and then I could read it through and make suggestions. Well, okay. My experience on projects has all been with closed groups. I don't really know how you go about selecting subjects from larger populations. Actually, it's it's quite straightforward. You use tables of randomised numbers. Could you show me? Yeah, I'll take you through the process. That way, you'll learn, and I'll feel surer for having someone else there.、Uh, now that brings us to the interviews themselves. Right. Would you like to do them, or are there too many? Well, your typing's pretty fast, isn't it? So if you agree to handle the transcribing afterwards, I'm prepared to do the face-to-face -face stage. Does that sound fair? It does to me. But tell me if you find it takes longer than you thought. And vice versa, and when we get the results all together, they'll need to be run through statistics programs, won't they? Well, that's where I always feel a bit unsure about which tests are the correct ones to choose. Same here, but we can get advice from the lecturers about that. Shall we do all that as a joint effort? I think it'd make us feel more secure about what we were doing. Yes, it would be terrible to get that wrong after all the hard work leading up to it. And then we've got to present the whole thing to the group. Will you feel up to doing that? I think we should do a joint presentation. It's all both our work, after all.、Mm, I guess you're right. But would you mind getting the slides and so on ready? I find that takes me ages and still doesn't look any good. <laughs> Whereas I quite enjoy that kind of thing. Okay. Now we need to think about a few. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part three. Listening, Part Four. You will hear a talk about waste and waste treatment. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to thirty-four.
Now listen to the first part of the talk and answer questions 31 to 34. Good afternoon, everybody. Today I'll be talking about the issue of waste, which has become an immense problem in today's society. We face huge challenges in terms of reducing its creation in the first place, and then in dealing with it when it has been created. Now, the model of nature would be our ideal, a completely cyclical system in which no excess waste is generated that can't be processed by itself. However, we humans have proved, despite our apparent intelligence and ingenuity, quite incapable of achieving this. Where did it all go wrong? We have evidence that in ancient Greece and Rome, governments operated municipal waste collection, and a huge Stone Age mound was identified some years ago in Norway as waste disposal. So we can see that people have been generating waste for a very long time indeed. However, during the Dark Ages, sophisticated municipal waste processing disappeared. The medieval answer to waste was to throw it out of the window. But this waste, apart from broken pottery and a few metal objects, was largely organic. This meant, of course, that it was quickly absorbed into the environment by the natural processes of decay. However, many concerned people, such as doctors, claimed that this created health problems although it wasn't until science produced convincing evidence of the connection between rubbish and disease that governments began to see the importance of dealing with the problem effectively. Unfortunately, their response has remained slower than the generation of waste. It is very hard to deal with waste that won't melt into the environment, as so many of our modern consumer goods won't. And that's why the invention of plastic has caused the worst headache for the environment. It's more than nature can deal with. Now you have some time to look at questions 35 to 37. Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions 35 to 37. In order to address the root of the problem of waste, we need to think about what has made the quantity of waste accelerate in growth. I'd identify three main reasons. As many countries became industrialized, we saw the advent of mass manufacturing. This has been enormously damaging as it has greatly increased the amount of things on the planet's surface which don't go away by themselves. Closely related to this is packaging, necessary for transporting things around the world, but then extremely difficult to get rid of properly. And a third aspect to the problem has been disposable goods. We have become accustomed to so many things being to use and then discard, that we find it hard to imagine life without them. And yet we spare little thought for where they go when we do discard them. Now you have some time to look at questions 38 to 40. Now listen to the rest of the talk and answer questions 38 to 40. Right now, let's move on from where all this waste comes from to what is done with it all now it's here. Different countries deal with waste differently. Of course, each country also changes what it does, so the figures for waste treatment I've got here are likely to change in the future. Let's look at municipal solid waste, or MSW. MSW is important to consider because it's effectively a measurement of consumerism, how much waste people produce 
that goes beyond the absolute basic requirements in life to eat and drink. One of the main ways of dealing with MSW is incineration, burning it. This is adopted variously around the world. The UK burns relatively little waste, as does the US, while Denmark burns about half of all waste. And Japan uses this method for as much as three quarters. These are broad brushstrokes, of course, because an important issue is how efficient and clean the burning process is. Another major form of waste treatment is using landfill sites, basically burying the waste in the earth. Currently, this method is the dominant process used in the UK at over 80%, and is also heavily used in Germany and in the US, while densely populated and mountainous countries such as Switzerland and Japan dispose of relatively little this way. A third and much better way of dealing with waste is to recycle it, turning it back into more things we need. It must be said that much depends here on whether further waste is generated by the recycling processes themselves. The UK and Japan have rather poor records in recycling, while Switzerland tops the table in this respect. And reasonably impressive levels are achieved by Denmark and Germany. I really hope that if we all gathered here again ten years from now, these figures would be much higher. Time and a lot of effort will tell. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.